Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to a new series called Deep Learning for Computer Architects. So this uh, series of presentations is based on a book called Deep Learning for Computer Architects, so the same name. Um, it came out in 2017, it's from Morgan Claypool Publishers, and it's from a series that's called the Synthesis Lectures on Computer Architecture. And I'll go ahead and uh, put a link to this book below. So what are we going to be covering in this series? So, you know, across the series, we're going to be looking at, you know, Machine learning is everywhere, but first of all, what is it? Uh, we're going to give some background on why is it important for computer architects today? And then where is the research going, right? So what has been done? Uh, what are people looking at now? And what are some problems that are still outstanding in the field? But before we do any of this, let's kind of give a history of neural networks um, in research. So um, neural networks is not really a new thing. Uh, so neural networks really came out um, and they started, you know, their initial um, growth in popularity in the late 1950s with these Rosenblatt perceptrons. And here we've got this uh, graph with this so-called hype curve, basically giving a rough estimate of the public perception or the research perception on neural networks over time. And what we really see here is there's an ebb and flow of interest um, over the years. So in the very early days, we had a lot of interest as it was just coming out. But people poke some holes in some of the ideas and people ended up becoming a bit pessimistic, especially around the um, early uh, or late 1960s, early 1970s. But, you know, as uh, you know, as funding grew, as you know, some of the problems were solved, what we ended up having is another spike upwards around the 80s, right, or, you know, early to mid 80s with the introduction of things like back, back propagation and vanishing gradient. But again, um, you know, this kind of age suffered from another problem, which was, you know, promises that couldn't be delivered on and, you know, a lot of overhyping. And so again, we saw another one of these ice ages all the way from the uh, later 1980s, early 1990s, um, going all the way until kind of the late uh, 2000s, early 2000s and ten, or early 2010s when we got AlexNet. So, you know, what happened around this time? So when AlexNet... Kind of the seminal paper came out you know what really happened was um, this massive spike um, in excitement because people started training uh, models on things like gpus right so gpus were this you know this massively parallel piece of hardware and then people realized well we've got a massively parallel problem um, such as these models so why don't we train them on this massively parallel hardware so now we see we've got this massive spike you know, in hype over neural networks and machine learning, and it doesn't look like it's going anywhere for the near future. And a lot of this comes back to this idea of this virtuous cycle, right? And it goes back to data, algorithms, and computation, and how each of these three things, um, you know, kind of feeds back into each other. So, you know, once we go ahead and get, you know, more sophisticated models, these end up requiring a lot more computational power, right? But, you know, this, I know, so this kind of feeds into the computation side of things and the hardware side of things, where architects, you know, they design new accelerators, they design new hardware to fit these new algorithms. And then suddenly we, we make it possible to work on larger and larger data sets, right? So the large data sets, you know, these end up growing and growing and growing until suddenly the algorithms that we originally had don't really fit the massive amount of data. So now the algorithms have to be updated. And so as you can see, um, we've got this you know, so-called virtuous cycle that's really at the heart of machine learning. So, you know, you know, with the internet and with all these new data sets, right, we have huge amounts of data. These end up leading to new algorithms, which leads to new, you know, even dedicated machine learning accelerators, which leads to, you know, the need for more and different kinds of data, right? So this has really been at the heart of, of deep learning. So, you know, we can, you know, basically segment, you know, these ideas into big data, big ideas, and big iron, iron referring to the hardware. So with big data, what we're talking about these large data sets, and these weren't always abundant, especially in the very early days of neural networks and machine learning. But you know, as you know, we've moved into the internet age, right? Suddenly this is less and less of a problem. And we have new problems such as now that we have so much data, what do we actually do with it, right? So now we actually have an, you know, an abundance of data. So then we also have our big ideas. So those problems that you know made people shy away from uh, neural networks or become pessimistic in the 80s and 90s, 
you know, they never really went away, but, you know, people were persistent and they made a lot of progress in moving past a lot of the hurdles that we had back then. And one of the biggest things that happened were these, you know, very specialized and dedicated um, domain specific networks, such as those for machine, uh, those for um, image recognition or um, speech um, translation. So um, we also saw a movement of neural networks into the real world. So no longer were neural networks something that um, were solely an academic idea. They started having real world application um, outside of the lab. And then of course we have um, one of the huge driving forces, which is going to be the main topic of this series, um, which is the architecture itself and the hardware. So Moore's law, or this idea that we get more and more transistors for um, you know, less and less price, uh, or for a much smaller price, um, you know, this has led to a lot of advancement in the field because suddenly we have so much more computational power um, and computational power in you know, the 80s and 90s, um, you know, this was really a bottleneck for a lot of the ideas that we had. Um, and even as frequency scaling started to slow down and stop in the you know, early to mid 2000s, you know, we even found ways around that. So we just started making larger and larger chips um, we entered the multi-core era, and now we've got you know giant uh, data parallel accelerators as well, and even dedicated accelerators such as the TPU, um, specifically for machine learning applications. So let's start talking about hardware and deep learning and where that's been. So like I said earlier, uh, GPUs and machine learning, um, it was a match made in heaven, right? So you know we had this problem uh, in machine learning where we really wanted uh, we had this giant, massively parallel problem. Um, you might hear it referred to as an embarrassingly parallel problem. And we just so happened to have a massively parallel accelerator, which was the GPU that was um, around in the early 2000s. And then some really clever people got the idea of why don't we map our massively parallel problem to the massively parallel accelerator, the GPU, right? And we started seeing some really, really great improvements um, in accuracy because we got to you know, train our models even faster. Um, and so this really decreased um, you know, the amount of time we needed to train so more and more ideas could be pushed out and pushed through. And you know, we've seen a lot of advancements over the you know, recent years, um, you know, moving past even things like GPUs. So GPUs themselves have adapted and even added more dedicated machine learning hardware. So this can be seen in you know, modern NVIDIA GPUs with you know, tensor processing units. Um, and then we've also seen it with dedicated accelerators, like I said earlier, the TPU and other academic accelerators you know, that are specifically for um, machine learning acceleration and even in niche areas such as in embedded devices uh, and edge devices where we want to do, we want to have machine learning applications running. And you know, one of the important things to know here um, is kind of the landscape in terms of what is the machine learning community doing and what is the computer architecture community doing and how there's um, not so much a rift as there is uh, a focus on different ideas. So a lot of the work in the machine learning community has been focused on this decrease in error, right? So you see these um, blue triangles and circles um, and the bottom, uh, the bottom axis is prediction error. And you see that a lot of the work in uh, the machine learning community has been decreasing the prediction error. But you see on the other side of things, um, you know, in this green with FPGAs and ASICs, um, we see that a lot of the work has actually gone into um, decreasing the amount of power. So here we see on the left axis, um, power in watts. You know, and this really comes down to the fact that uh, we want to start putting machine learning um, in you know things like edge devices and mobile devices that are on a really constrained power budget. So we really need to be concerned about you know how much power it's going to take um, to run it on these edge devices, right? While in the machine learning community, of course, we're, we're always still going to be concerned about what is the actual error going to be. An improvement um, in that area is you know can we make this as good as possible, have as low as error as possible. So here we see kind of a you know a conflict of ideas, and we'll go into this more when we start talking about you know the scope of computer architecture and the spoke the the uh, scope um, and focus of machine learning research um, today and what it looks like in the future. So as kind of a bonus image, we can see uh, an image of the Mark One uh, perceptron built by uh, Frank Rosenblatt. 
um, at Cornell in the 1960s, right? So you see, we've come a long way since these very early days. So we've got this uh, jumbled rat's nest of wires, you know, connecting things together. But now we have this nice, pretty, um, you know, dedicated accelerators that are, you know, just orders and orders of magnitude um, faster uh, than anything that you know, this could possibly do but we see that you know at the heart of it is still architecture right so people even back back then right not relying on general purpose computation but building dedicated machines to do things like uh, neural networks right? and that's where we are today so that's going to go ahead and do it for this very brief introduction so we're going to have a lot more videos on this series soon covering the fundamentals of uh, machine learning and neural networks and going into you know some of the really big ideas of comp in computer architecture for things like deep learning. So um, that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. As always, all this stuff is going to be online and you can check out any of my other uh, content at um, github.com slash coffee before arch. So you know, this will have you know, all the content for all my GP programming, CPU programming, parallel programming series as well. So stay tuned for more. As always, I'm Nick and I hope you have a nice day.